Very often in Pokemon, due to the nature of the tournament structure, the embers of rivalry get snuffed out. Our tournaments follow a Swiss format, meaning every round you play another random competitor with the same record as you. Swiss rounds are certainly efficient for big tournaments, and they allow players to always play the nine rounds they paid for, regardless of their record. But the randomness of Swiss prevents tournaments from having any type of seeding, which is fine, but as a side effect, it means we don't get to see similar brackets pit two players against each other frequently, if it even happens at all. To add to this, our stream matches only begin on round three, and we typically only ever get one per round, maybe two if we're lucky. So out of thousands of battles that get played, we only usually see less than 10 per day. Over the last year, the finals of every major tournament was a new matchup. We saw players like Wolf Glick, Riley Factura, Ragav Malavia, and Joe Ugarte make several finals each, but it was never a rematch of a recent final that the viewers could follow along with. Granted, the finals in Orlando was the third time Wolf won a championship over Ashton Cox, but the last time they fought for a title was five years before that. So rivalry and competitive Pokemon, it doesn't happen very often, and it happens on camera even less. At least, until it kinda does. No two players in the game's history have more parallels than James Evans and Toller Webb. Both have won the Senior Division World Championships. Both have won a national championship on American soil. And both players met each other in top eight of the Orlando Regional Championships in 2023. Now to be clear, I'm not trying to bend the narrative here. These players don't have any type of beef. I just believe this was a slightly overlooked story at the Knoxville Regional Championships. So I messaged James, Toller, and his team building partners to get a closer look at what I believe is one of competitive Pokemon's invisible rivalries. As a player who grew up in the senior division, much like Toller, I had to play against a lot of the same players. James and I have played twice at this point. The last time I made a top eight, the last time I was even in striking distance of winning a tournament. I had not played Toller up until Orlando Regional's top eight. This is the career that I hoped you would have if you were inspired by me. Like here, I, I built my own enemy here with James Evans, I guess, to an extent. I was very, very nervous. I was already coming off of playing two really good players in top 32 and top 16 sets. Uh, and now I have to play another world champion. Toller is one of those players that even before I think he knew who I was, I looked up to him a lot. Uh, one of my favorite sets of all time is his world set where he wins the finals and it was really 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 cool to me just to go up and play someone I, I had admired for so long as a player. At that point it was the largest regional so obviously a lot of stress riding on my back. I was very very fearful of how game 3 was going to go. In that case, it was bad. You know, th there are things that people are worried about, you know, James rolling around after winning, or maybe like the way that he celebrates being like particularly bad. That didn't bother me as much because I knew that he's young, he was excited, and he said after our set in Orlando that I was an inspiration for him, and that, that also kind of warmed my heart a little bit. So while I wish that I could have gone back and had another set against him at Orlando and, and showed the world that I had a, a real shot of beating him, I was accepting at that point, or I was accepting at least by Knoxville. I had played Golden Go a lot in Reg E, and I really liked how it played, especially with Redirection. It was essentially like playing Kyogre after you got a Nasty Plot up, right? At plus two, Make It Rain knocks out almost everything, and with a Metal Coat, it knocks out even more. So Justin Knox came up to uh, the our MPA server before, like a week and a half before Knox was like, I found the Knox call. And I DM'd him like, no, you didn't. <laughs> and he said, no, I did. Look, it's Redirection Gambit, and it was literally Raga's San Antonio team. 
And I said, I don't like Gambit. And kind of all snowballed from there is like, okay, I like Golden Go a lot. Golden Go is a really good user of redirection. I really liked it with Tornadus. And then we saw Eduardo Cunha pop off with Tornadus and Raging Bolt. And um, at that point it was like, I think this is the best version of the team to bring. So let's just focus on refining that. I just kind of started talking about in chat as I think I had a good idea. I was really thinking Clefairy was going to be the meta call and Tola was interested in it. I was working on Clefairy King Gambit, but he was more interested in Clefairy Goldango. So I had tested it uh, up until about Liverpool and I ended up dropping it just because it. And I was sitting there watching Liverpool and I was noticing, I was trying to think of big threats that were going to come up from this tour. And I was noticing that Goldango just really beats a lot of these teams, particularly the Alex or Alex Gomez's team with the Ting Lu, Porygon 2, I felt like Goldango was extremely dominant in that matchup. This was a strong possibility that people were really going to bring this to Knoxville, especially with the short turnaround. So I became extremely interested in Goldango at the time. I was excited to work with Justin Knox because essentially it feels like every tournament he's attended, he's made a really good meta call for. And something I've really struggled with is actually making solid meta calls for the tournaments that I've attended. I came in for the meta calls and was surprised by his um, positive, like really positive mindset prep process was like, okay, if that didn't work, let's fix it. Like very forward thinking. I thought it was super helpful. And I think we learned a lot from each other. Although I said good things about the team prep process, I wasn't confident at all in it. Essentially, I had gone on ladder and lost to Raging Bolt Inte, lots of like Assault Vest Raging Bolt teams. And I think I said, and Raging Bolt Roaring Moon was also scary because Roaring Moon could pressure Dango immediately as well. And I said to Nox before the tournament, I think Wednesday before the tournament, I think I'm dropping the team. And he said, okay, like if that's what you feel is best, then like that's fine. I'm still going to play it because I think it's good. And so I picked Arch Rain back up, which I had been working on a lot in the past two months at that point. And I played it a little bit and I was like, ah, every matchup feels kind of hard. And I played it through Thursday and talked with people and decided that was what I was going to do. And then Friday morning I woke up and it's like, well, I think I have to play Dango. I'm probably going to be able to make it through day one with this team. And then when I hit day two, I'll probably flounder and like fall apart in front of these Raging Bolt teams. And fine, like I need the points, I need to make worlds. And so I came into the tournament with no expectations. Essentially, whatever happened at that point happened. It, it was all in sort of the tourney's hands and, and my ability to play well. And if there's one thing I had some confidence in, it was uh, leaning on that experience to play good Pokemon with people. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the beautiful Knoxville, Tennessee, here at the Pokemon Video Game Regional Championships. 463 Masters are vying for the title of Regional Champion here at the Knoxville Convention Center. Day one kind of started out like really, really quiet. I didn't really have a lot going on. I was just kind of like, okay, just another tournament, play through it. And then I kind of got to round five where it was a pretty solid matchup, but I didn't play as well as I expected. And I won the game off a, my Rillaboom surviving a helping hand Terror Dark Wicked Blow, which kind of kicked the day into high gear more than anything. So it was kind of just like, a, ooh, I didn't expect to win that. Maybe re start reevaluating the rest of the day. I felt like I hadn't had to really push myself so far. I mean, I was a little scared about Jared Hun and he definitely gave me trouble, but I was worried because typically this has been a really common pattern for me at tournaments where I'll start three or four oh or four one or something like that and then not quite focus up all the way and then sort of lose steam later in the day and go X2 if I if I even make day two. And really I felt like the best chances I had of winning the tournament were happening at X1 and I'm always going to tournaments planning to win. So I was nervous going to this round because I was 4-0 so far but hadn't really tested myself. What was staring at me from across the table was a very strange team with, I believe, Terra Fairy, Moonblast, Ursaluna, Blood Moon. I tried to use Incineroar and Golden Go game one to deal with the potential Blood Moon type leads or like aggressive leads that way, but he just led Gouging Fire and Water Pond and I lost kind of slowly on tempo. Um, and so I realized that lead wasn't going to work. And game two, I saw that his Ogre Pond was really slow. It looked like it was max HP, max adamant. To work around that, I knew my Urshfu was gonna be faster no matter what. So I led Urshfu and Tornadus, and actually my Tornadus was faster than it too. So I led Urshfu and Tornadus, and then clicked Bleak when it tear Dark Wicked Blow, and slowly went on tempo that way. I'm expecting Fluttermane Tornadus exactly. I'm going to still lead Tornadus Urshifu because I think it's going to give me a window to click Tailwind and Terra Dark Wicked Blow into his Fluttermane, and then I'll win the game from there. And so I lead Tornadus Urshifu. He leads exactly Tornadus Fluttermane. I got everything right. And then I'm like, eh, he's probably gonna like switch Fluttermane out or 
maybe he'll Tailwind to try to beat my Tailwind, and if I'm expecting Tailwind, then I'll just keep my Sash around, and I'm faster than his Tornadus anyway with Urshifu, I'll just click Bleak Wind Wicked Blow. And I lost the game instantly, because he just clicked Icy Wind, and or he just used Icy Wind and Bleak Wind Storm, hit all his attacks, my Urshifu went down, and I ran out of resources right there on turn one. And so, in a sense, like my worst fear had come true. I had gotten either scared or lazy, I got cold feet about the play that I planned, you know, well, like, well before game three even happened. Uh, I was like halfway through game two, and I was like, I'm probably doing this. I got scared about a play and decided on something foolish and took a loss that I didn't need to take. I knew that my team felt really strong into the field and that I'd run into a lot of good matchups. I was nervous after that loss. One of the things I struggle the most with is doubting myself. And when you make a mistake like that, you can't help but think, man, maybe I'm not supposed to succeed this time. Maybe I'm just going to lose all the rest. And it's very easy to let that avalanche fall down on top of you and lose two or three more games in a row. What was different this time was the environment that I was in. Not only had I just made top eight at Charlotte, but I'd also made top eight at Charlotte by dealing with my demons, like battling with myself about, look, like one mistake is not the end of you. You are more than just whatever individual play you make when you're at a tournament. This is an aggregation of things. Like I'm nervous that I'm gonna make more mistakes, but at the same time, like what's in my control is what I do next. The big theme of the tournament for me, mentality-wise, was acceptance. I just kind of played how I normally played, and I ended up going 8-0 and to start. And I, I was in my last round, before round 9, I actually had to play against Joe UX9, who I think I've played it three tournaments this year so far, which was just another really funny like matchup because we have very similar teams and we play very similarly. We discuss and build a lot together, but I was able to take that win too. And then I got to round 9, 8-0, so I was already confirmed for day 2 at X and 1 minimum. Really, really wanted to win my last set. Go 9-0 again, it'd be the first time I've done that since Hartford Regionals in 2023, so it'd be my second time overall. But I think Logan played really, really well. But it did kind of give me this feeling of, I, I wasn't mad that I had lost, and it was very much something that I did on my own to lose the game. When you lose on your own volition, it's obviously very frustrating because you could have won the game if you just made a better play but i think approaching it in a healthy manner really really helps especially when you're going into a second day of tournament like that where you kind of need to not only reset your mental but just kind of look at it in the most positive way possible when i sat down for round six it was all about what i was going to do next not about what i had already done i knew those raging bolt balance teams were coming for me and i knew that they were sitting there at the x1 tables because they were good but in round six, instead of running into one of those, I ran into a Weezing team. And any experienced Golden Go player loves battling Weezing. Golden Go sets up for free. Weezing can't touch it. The worst it can do is click Taunt. And what that meant was game one, I won with Golden Go. Game two, I knew he wasn't gonna bring Weezing and brought in Cinderor instead, shut down his Iron Hands immediately and uh, took the game from there. Round seven, I am two wins away from making day two. You get one loss to bad play and you get one loss to bad luck. And so I'm waiting for the bad luck that's gonna happen. Round seven, it almost is. I run into a matchup that Yotam told me I probably wasn't gonna be able to beat this tournament and it's Chen Pao and Dragonite. So that archetype had fallen off going into this tournament. And not only was it Pao Knight, but it was also Dondozo. So it was the Chapa Glamora Dondozo type team that we saw succeed in Portland. I went into this round thinking, man, my luck is run out. Like I am gonna lose the matchup. That's what Yotam said to me is that it didn't matter what player it was. I was very likely to lose the matchup. <laughs> Game one, I went for my, the only player that felt like it had worked against Pound Knight, Ogre Pond, Golden Go, and lo and behold, he led Dragonite Glamora. That really surprised me. And it made me think, even though I lost this game because he got free Earthquake into himself at Spikes, maybe he's gonna keep doing this. I also saw that Golden Go outsped both Glamora and Dragonite. So what that meant I could do is the next two games rely on Golden Go to clear Glamora with a turn one make it rain and clear the Dragonite with my other Pokemon. And then I could beat Dundoza with Darker Shifu in the back. And I did that twice in a row. Now we're at 6-1, one. one more win locks day two, and more importantly, I'm still at X1, so I have a real chance of going X1 into day two, which is huge for tiebreakers going into top eight. I really wanna set that up to the best of my ability. I can pull a bunch of matchups, I don't even know how to win yet. So I'm sitting here rolling the dice, praying that everything goes the way that it needs to go, because it doesn't take too good of a player to beat me on one of these bad matchups, as I almost learned in round seven. One of the only remaining Porygon Tinglu teams piloted by Jonathan Duran is what I pull, and it is just as clinical as it was in round two, notably more difficulty because Jonathan's a pretty experienced player and really, really tried to figure out the matchup on the fly, and he struggled. So I not only didn't get unlucky, I got very lucky with the matchup that I pulled and felt very fortunate after this round, having sealed up day two. This is where it's like Justin Knox didn't get to experience the medical buff, but I definitely did.
when I was younger, I, I put a lot more pressure on myself to kind of be perfect. Obviously, you learn a lot from being critical of yourself, being harsh on yourself, but it's not exactly healthy. That's something I've been trying to do a lot more while playing the game as an adult, just because it's obviously not my only focus, and if I play this game to have fun, so I don't want to be stressed in that. It's definitely something I think is more important to me playing personally, uh, just having a good time and not stressing about it, but I've also learned more just by being positive and more constructive of my play instead of just ripping it to shreds. Winning meant I was X1 going into day two, and that's the best result I've had. I had a long string from NAIC where I went 5-4 through Worlds 4-3, Pittsburgh 6-3, Toronto 6-3, where I couldn't make day two. And then back to back, Charlotte, we make a day two at X2. And then Knoxville, I'm going to day two X1, much to my surprise because my preparation, I was dropping this team. I felt like I hadn't prepped enough. I felt like I wasn't rested enough. When I just let the game kind of go the way it was gonna go and play to the best of my ability and pulled good matchups, things went my way. I got the best sleep I have ever gotten before a Pokemon tournament day in the past year. I always am playing tournaments sleep deprived because my anxiety keeps me from sleeping enough. The games that people are afraid of playing me in like in practice and stuff like that are all me well rested so <laughs> I felt like I'd been playing at 80% of potential the whole time and then going into this day too like I was at 95 98 like I was almost at the best I could do starting off day two I was a little nervous uh, just because I woke up and the entirety of my Airbnb got an uber ride without me so I had to find a way to the venue uh, roughly by myself <laughs> Starting the day, I was a little panicked. I was like, okay, you know, these things happen though. Get it together. And then round one, I played a very, very strong opponent uh, in Avery. Uh, and she, we used to play in seniors. So it was really kind of cool to see her back in this day two position. Cause she was a super talented player when we played in seniors. She took a big hiatus and then she came back and she was just strong as ever. Uh, and that was also kind of a rough way to start the day because I ended up losing that matchup. I start right away with a down pair. I go up against Drew Brown. I don't know this player at all. And when I sit down, I'm like, well, okay, how'd your day go yesterday? What, what are you bringing? Do you know what I'm bringing? I ask him, do you know what my team is? He's, yeah, he knows my six. I don't know his six. We load into team preview. I see his sheet. Lo and behold, <laughs> it's Raging Bolt, Landorus Eye, and Water Ogre Pod with Speed Booster Flutter and Icy Wind. This matchup that I have not won a single game in. To cut a long story short, I get an Ivy Cudgel crit game one. Game two, I lose on the end game 50-50s that he forces me into because he's a good player. And game three, he's still frustrated about the Ivy Cudgel crit and I feel like I caught him a little bit unawares by bringing Golden Go in the back and beating his Fairy Bolt that way. I told myself, it's not really the end of the world. I'm just gonna shake it off and keep playing my best today, hopefully. Round three, I got a very interesting pair up in Andrew Nowak. We've played before, but this set was very, very close, and I had to call seven thunderclaps in a row to win the game, uh, which is gonna be a story I probably tell people a lot from now on. Round two, I run into another auto win, um, at least in my my perspective, but I get beaten to, to an inch of my life both games by um, Avery Beery, who's walloping on my Golden Go every opportunity she gets with Snarls and Stomping Tantrums, even at minus two. And I finish both games with Golden Go sitting at 5% of its HP. And then next round, I'm running into uh, Wu Chun right there with the Raging Bolt Landorus I team again. This is the one that I think locks my, my top eight. And I lose game one very cleanly. I get the lead wrong. But games two and three, he brings a Sui and Arcanine and Water Ogre Pond in the back or in the front is very good at clearing that Pokemon. I don't get flinched by Rock Slide and I'm able to win and probably secure top eight. But then we go into round 13 and there's Justin Tang sitting across from me. Defending Knoxville champion Justin Tang. I know if I do this, I'm absolutely locked for top eight. So I really want to win. And he's just coming off a big stream, stream win still amped up from that. And I'm sitting there like, man, I don't know if I can win this matchup again. Justin's on a different level and I've never beaten him on ladder. <laughs> I've never beaten him in practice, really. We load in the game, he three O's me twice. No question. I didn't have a shot. I get blown out of the water. He gets both leads totally right. Hits three reads in a row, both games. And it really looked like I wasn't even trying. So I'm going into round 14, wondering if I still have a chance if Tang is making top eight, which he absolutely is after that win. I got those three wins in a row and I felt like I was doing really well and then losing to Tang so concisely. You know, if the game was an essay, he wrote a perfect three paragraph essay and counter argumented all the points that I made in my 20 page book. And I'm sitting there like, I'm doubting myself again. I don't know if I can win. I don't know if I can win against him and I don't know if I can win against the rest of the field if I'm still 
fighting against that echelon of players that I haven't been able to break into. That loss really shook my faith. I ended up playing Toller Web. I've just lost to Tang, and then I see that I'm across the table from James Evans. James Evans beat me in top eight of Orlando. He's a player that is phenomenal the whole year. He's been doing well at almost every tournament he attends. I realize this is another chance for me to beat a player that I want to be on the caliber of long term. If I want a chance at the World Championship, I need to be good enough to beat James Evans or Justin Tang. Fighting with that thought that I, that I want to win to prove myself, to myself really, is the sneaking voice in the back of my head that's telling me, look, if you lose to James, you might get better top eight opponents. Being a higher seed would mean that I would be at risk of maybe fighting Wu Yi Chun if he sneaks his way into top eight. And he has a really bad matchup for me that I think he'll have figured out by now. Could mean that I fight Orsi, could mean that I fight Luca Paz, matchups that I'm concerned about that I think could happen. And I spend way too much time thinking about maybe it would be better to lose here and don't engage with that competitive drive of wanting to beat James Evans to prove myself. And what happens? I get walked all over. And after this game, I'm sitting there wondering if there's any way for me to win this matchup. I actually beat him in round 14. Uh, he said very commandingly, I don't think so. But I felt really, really good going through Swiss. I felt just very comfortable with my team. I felt very confident in myself even after the round one loss. Even if the day starts out bad, you just gotta, you just gotta keep going. It's really tough to recover from that. And I've felt that way before. So focus more on the good than the bad, even when it's pretty bad. I'm fighting Avery for the second time this tournament. I honestly couldn't be happier with the matchup that I pulled. I mean, Avery is a phenomenal player, but everyone in top eight is a phenomenal player. And I'd much prefer to be fighting this Porygon Tinglu team for the fourth time than I would fighting Justin Tang or someone like that. And so going to this matchup, I'm fully expecting to see some sort of additional expansion on what Avery did to me in <laughs> in our round 11. Outside of the table, and for Toller, this is a complete change up than what we saw from his Charlotte team. We'll get into that in just a couple of seconds. I'm worried about Ting Lu chipping down my Golden Go. I'm worried about Incineroar throwing out Flare Blitzes willy-nilly while I try to reposition. And I'm trying to be very well prepared for the possibility of back Flutter Main or back Como to deal with me once TRs run out. I was expecting to see lots of things that would chip down my Dango and lots of aggressive plays. And instead Avery went for a trick. And I saw it right away, this possibility of Incineroar using Terra Ghost to avoid my fake out and clicking knock off on Golden Go, which is why I dodged it with Ogre Pond. But it makes me worried that she'll go for another trick game two that I might not see coming. Going into this game two, my plan is largely the same as it's been every single time I fought this team in the tournament and even uh, in game one of the set. Up that game number one, and we look forward to this second game in the set. Can Avery make any adjustments here? I'm going to try to set up Golden Go and try to click make it rain as many times as I can. I had a set of mantras. One, which was I'm typically kind of careless, so I have one mantra that was make a plan and check it. Start each turn in my head by thinking, okay, I need to do, I need to make a plan and then I'll make one and then check it rather than panic until the last minute. And that sometimes helps. And then I have another mantra that I was using, which was this like never give up kind of mentality, which was if you're backed into a corner, fight. You're not at this tournament to lose and you're not gonna die if you lose, so don't try to run away. You have to make reads and go for aggressive plays and like try to win even when you're behind. It was, it was Justin Karras himself who told me that one. The third new mantra for this tournament that I realized because I had been so calm the whole time, had felt like happy in a way that I hadn't had a tournament in a long time, was play with love. Play with love for the game, play with love for your opponent, play with love for every opportunity that you're given in this moment. So my top move is against Nora Bowman. She's a really good friend of mine and I believe this was her first top cut like at a major ever. 
So it was really, really cool to see her in cut, but I was a little nervous going into the matchup because my team does not like fighting Scarf or Shifu, even though it has two grass types. The other Pokemon on our team made it really, really tough to not only break a Scarf or Shifu, but to break everything on the team as well. I did get really, really, really lucky in game one. I got two crits, a double protect, pretty much just everything fell my way. So I felt really, really bad taking that game off of Nora because she played excellently in game one. Game two was a lot more comfortable. I made a lot more, what I would call reads, like just much more comfortable plays in my side of the court that kind of just gave me the win off the bat because I was able to play much more aggressive than I had played in game one. And I will say right now, Nora was an excellent sport about it. She was super happy uh, just to make cut and she we hugged afterwards. She was really happy just in general to see her friend make top four, which I appreciate very much, Nora. <laughs> Every trick in my book could get foiled by the, the, the GU, so I had to play very honest Pokemon with Luka Paz. After fighting Justin Tang, I felt like I had four possible leads. Incineroar Raging Bolt, Raging Bolt Water Pawn, and Urshifu and Incineroar. Um, so those were all leads that I tried that had worked, and I had also tried Water Pawn Urshifu and lost, uh, lost with it. Against Luka Paz, I just noted what had worked and hadn't worked in my Day 2 Swiss games and decided to sort of roll the dice on which one I did. Game one, I tried Incineroar and Urshifu, trying to catch something like a Water Pond lead, and I got it. I nailed Water Pond Raging Bolt and was able to clear the Water Pond right away. The Raging Bolt took very li little from Wicked Blow. Having had like that go well and have the plan go like exactly how I expected it to, where I was able to win with Bolt and Water Pond in the end game. Game two, I led Bolt and Water Pond and then basically had a series of best case scenarios, I guess is the right way to put it. I was able to clear Raging Bolt immediately with a combo of Terra Water, Ivy Cudgel, and Draco Meteor. And Raging Bolt was the biggest issue for the rest of my team. So at that point, it was all a matter of clicking Ivy Cudgel into the right targets. Lo and behold, I got the opportunity to click it um, straight away into Fluttermane because he didn't follow me. And then straight away into Landorus because again, he didn't follow me. So. I felt like I had covered everything with those plays, knowing that if he did follow me, he wasn't going to net a big advantage, so he had to try to swing for a haymaker after the turn one, but it still looked kind of uh, flashy on stream. I've been at this point so many times in regionals and it's like especially across my entire career i'm like in top four now uh you know you get your medal you get your money you get your points it's it's nice no matter what obviously you want to win i didn't really look at the matchup beforehand and it turned out to be way better than i expected it was one of those things that i looked at the sheet and i was a little perplexed by some of the item choices um but enrique kind of proved that they were valid it kind of felt like a completely different story when we hopped into the game. I felt just super, super in the driver's seat the entire time. And I wasn't kind of expecting to win going into the tournament more than anything. I just did not believe I was going to make it that far of a run. I definitely was just kind of going in with the mindset of, uh, I'm just going to play my best today and we're just going to see where it takes me. And it ended up taking me to finals. So I was very excited to be there in the moment. And I was just telling myself, like, one more, you can win this event. Watching top four, since I got to play my top four set first, I got to watch a little bit of top four. Mostly I was just concerned with making sure I was in the right mindset. Between each of these sets, I was going outside and doing exercise. I, I, I joked to the judges that I needed to go see the sun because I was like photosynthesizing or something. But I did watch a little bit of James Evans and Enrique. Honestly, the thing I was most worried about was looking at what Enrique was doing because I had no idea how his team worked. I didn't know any of his speeds. I didn't know any of his stats. I didn't know what his, uh, his plans were. There were lots of things that were really surprising about his team. So I was trying to take notes about what he was doing. And at the same time, in the back of my mind, working out what I was going to do if, the, if it was James. And James Evans in a 2-0 is going to win this top four match and move on to the grand finals. So James and I have played twice at this point. Once this tournament where he beat me in the last round of Swiss. So he's beaten me pretty recently. But also a year ago, the last time I made a top eight, the last time I was even in striking distance of winning a tournament. And in that case, it was bad. And he said after our set in Orlando that I was an inspiration for him and that, that also kind of warmed my heart a little bit. So while I wish that I could have gone back and had another set against him at Orlando and, and showed the world that I had a, a real shot of beating him, I was accepting at that point, or I was accepting at least by Knoxville. 
this is the career that I hoped you would have if you were inspired by me. Like here, I, I've built my own enemy here with James Evans, I guess, to an extent. Going into finals with Toller, I was a little stone-faced. I tried to just not feel nervous or anything. It was a run back, so I felt like he was going to adjust well. Toller's an amazing player and he's got a lot of uh, people to discuss game plans with. I knew, the, I knew the game plan that I had going in was probably strong. Uh, just because Landorus Incarnate is just a very tough Pokemon for his team to deal with if Urshifu can't get going. But I didn't want to count him out immediately just because I had won the set before. I'm basically staking everything in this first game on this lead with um, Tornadus and Golden Go. And the plan is, if he leads Fluttermane Landorus again, to just click his tail and make it rain immediately. I see something I'm not expecting, but he led Rillaboom and Landorus. Once again, just like in round five of day one, I get cold feet and I see this plan like, oh, what if I switch an Incineroar here and then I have Fake Out into Landers, and then I plot and then I bring back in Tornadus and then I can tail and make it rain and I can get even more value. The cost of that mistake is colossal because I completely forgot that his Rillaboom had taunt. And I did this four turn calculation where I was going to set up a Tailwind and plus two make it rain, risking the whole time the possibility of him clicking substitute and completely forgot that I wasn't even gonna be able to click Tailwind. So I had to completely reevaluate my plan starting from turn four <laughs> or turn five of that first game. And then it was improv from there. I was just clicking bleak wins, trying to clear away the Rillaboom, trying to clear away the Landorus. It was out of my hands at that point. I had to hit enough bleak wins to win the game. And I should have lost anyway um, after making that much of a mistake because I, as expected, double missed bleak win and didn't get to break Fluttermane Sash. And my plan was, okay, I'm gonna get a bleak win hit on Fluttermane, a bleak win hit on Ogre Pond, and then I'm going to be able to win the game by clicking Wicked Blow into Ogre Pond with two turns of Tailwind left, and then Wicked Blow into Fluttermane on the last turn of Tailwind. And that was always what I was trying to set up. But the problem was, was with the Bleakwood miss, I didn't have a chance to break the Fluttermane Sash. And the crucial turn was the turn before Urshifu came in. I was going to get knocked out by Moonblast on my Incineroar, and so Incineroar had lost just enough health to be in range of another Moonblast. Moonblast had done like a little over 90 damage, and I was just in range of getting knocked out by that, so I'd made two mistakes this game. And even just follow me would be enough to keep me from breaking the Fluttermane Sash, and I would lose with Urshifu in the end game. But lucky for me, he thought that, uh, as I recall, Dazzling Gleam was the way to go, and so I got a knockoff on the Fluttermane, and at that moment, I told him, James, good game. Um, and he looked at me with bewilderment for a second before he realized that Dark Urshifu in the back with three turns of Tailwind was unbeatable at that point. Um, there was no feasible way for him to win the game. I felt kind of fortunate that he made a misplay in the same way that I had made, you know, two misplays already that game, but I knew I needed to focus up going in the game too. Game two, I really think I need to cover for Gouging Fire and King Gambit. Um, I can't take the same risk I did game one, and I don't think he has any reason to lead Rillaboom and Landorus again, given that I've just shown him a lead that is frankly toxic to that one. So I lead Raging Bolt and Water Pond, and the idea here is that I'm pretty safe to get a nice cudgel into Landorus Eye, even if he leads it, but he leads exactly the same as he led game one. He leads Rillaboom and Landorus, and that's not good news for me. The damage that he's going to throw down is going to be either Woodhammer into Ogre Pond, Fake Out into Ogre Pond, something with Rillaboom into Ogre Pond, and then either Earth Power into Raging Bolt or Substitute. And that means that I have a completely safe switch into Tornadus. And at that point, after bringing Tornadus in, I needed to just click Bleak Wind as many times as I could, hope I hit, hope I broke Substitutes, hope I damaged the Rillaboom. Um, I got fortunate that I hit the Ogre Pond on the switch in. Um, but still missed a few. Uh, after hitting enough bleak wins, I, I knew that I was in a really good spot to win. Raging Bolt was gonna come back in. I was going to be able to Terra Fairy freely into Landorus and Fluttermane. And with that terrestrialization available, um, there was no way that he was gonna be able to deal enough damage to me. The only uncertain factor was hitting Draco Meteor and hitting Bleak Wind Storm, especially into the Landorus. And what made it even worse was when Moonblast special attack dropped my Tornadus. I knew that Bleak Wind probably wasn't gonna get his Landorus, even if it hit. And so I had to double cover that slot with Draco Meteor and Bleak Wind Storm, even though there was a Fluttermane on the field that was immune to Draco Meteor if Bleak Wind got the KO and got redirected. Luckily for me, I hit both attacks into Landorus in the crucial turn, and Raging Bolt was able to clean up the minus one special attack Fluttermane to end the game. With that crit, and Toler Web wins the Knoxville Regional Championships! I've always wanted to win a regional, and I've been close two times in a row now. Um, but it's it's one of those things that I knew after I had lost the the match It was it was just wasn't my time yet And I always feel like it's one of those things that when it 
is meant to happen, it will happen. And, you know, one day I'll be up there with my gold regional medal, hopefully. Uh, but today just wasn't that day. And to get second place is always tough. Everyone tells you that it's tough, it sucks. Um, but it's always a good reminder of just how far you have to go just to win still. I have so much to learn about this game still before I can, I personally can call myself one of the best players. That win meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me because it like proved to me that I had the chance to win. And after a year of doubting myself and getting consistently worse tournament results end over end, falling apart more and more every time I played, beating myself up, it was, it was hard having that kind of sequence all through 2023 where I felt like the year started with a lot of promise and then fell apart. And I was worried that I wasn't improving. And what Knoxville showed me and in tandem with Charlotte, right? Like I had two big results back to back was that maybe I was improving. Maybe I had been doing something right this whole time. And maybe I didn't need to doubt everything about my practice. Of course, like the thing that's in my control is what I do every time I prepare. And this gave me a lot of confidence in that. It gave me a lot of confidence in my preparation cycle. It gave me a lot of confidence in the friends that I was working with. And it gave me a lot of confidence in the small choices I made before this tournament. But it was a combination of a good day, both in game and a good day for me, well rested, playing well. And I was very proud of not only the games that I played against the game two that I played against James Evans, but also both games against Luca Paz. You know, a lot of people were like, man, this matchup looked pretty easy. And I knew that it was very hard against him. The principal thing for me after all these years is playing beautiful games of Pokemon. And at the end, I felt like I'd done that at least a few times and added something positive to the history books. I had to play against a lot of the same players growing up in seniors because it's such a condensed pool. When you play them over and over and over again, that rivalry kind of naturally forms because you're playing so many times, you just wanna you just wanna best them more often than not. And at this point, Toler and I have played three times now. I have won two of those but he did win the more important one. We're probably going to play again at some point. Maybe it'll be four years from now in a completely different format on a completely different console. There's always probably going to be a chance that we play again. And if we do play again, obviously I'm going to want to win. James is a phenomenal player and he doesn't have a regional championship yet in Masters as I recall. And he saw this as his chance. He saw that he was really, really close and really wanted the opportunity and it crushed him to lose. But what really impressed me about him was how well he took it. He was really focused on the things he could have done differently and very focused on the idea that this wasn't the end of his story. So we talked about that a little after the set. I gave him a hug, reminded him that even though I inspired him, maybe he also inspires me with all the work he does in the game every time he attends a tournament. From that point there, it was just like, sort of like breathing out for the first, like fully breathing out for the first time in the last two days. Maybe for the, for a year, in a sense, like Charlotte felt like I had freed myself a little bit and proved that I could make another top eight, which meant a lot to me. Knoxville was a weapon like that I could hold and wield against myself whenever I told myself I wasn't good enough.